Hello and welcome to Ziggs, Rolly, and Bonham, the place where three college students get to talk about sports and one gets graded for it. I am your host, Connor Bonham. My esteemed co-hosts today are Will Rolder and Robert Zaglinski. Our producers today are Devin Ortiz and Alex Lobb. On today's episode, we have junior football player Shaq Perez, and today we're going to talk about the Bulls and Derrick Rose finally stringing some games together, the mess that is the Bears, and the upcoming week for the Blackhawks along with a broad NHL view. But first, let's talk to Shaq. Shaq, how are you doing? Doing pretty good, and yourself? Doing pretty good. Um, So, obviously, the season, the football season, didn't really go as planned. Um, What do you think the main reason was? Um, Well, to be honest, I feel like our main reason was, uh, you know, we have a really young team, a lot of uh, inexperience in a lot of different positions. Um, But I see a lot of potential on our team. You know, we're coming along. Just got to keep working hard. We have the right people right now. Um, You know, they're fully committed to the cause. We're going to bringing some really good recruits coaching staff's great love everybody on the team so you know just got to stick together and keep working so you say that uh you know it didn't go the way you wanted but how did the practices reflect that like were they intense practices yeah for the most part um throughout the entire season you know we had our up and downs there were some times where we could have performed better at, pra- at practice you know as a whole um but to be honest i mean we had some pretty good intensity you know really physical practices um, towards the end of the season, we were just focusing more on, you know, the me- the mental errors and, you know, getting our plays down, things like that, game planning. Because, you know, that late in the season, you know, you're focusing – you have so many injuries on the team, you're trying to focus more on the mental aspect so that you don't risk any loss to injury for the games. Individually, do you have any specific goals for yourself next for next season? Individually, uh, my number one goal, honestly, is to win conference. You know what I mean? That's – the one thing I want to do, so individually, just so you're not selfish. Okay, <laughs> not selfish. <laughs> yeah, I try not to be selfish. Um, you know, my number one goal ultimately is just to win some games and win conference. You know, that's the one thing I want for this team for myself. Um, in high school, I never had a winning record. You know, I went to brand new high school, Plainfield East. Um, so, you know, my best record was three and six. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's funny to think about, but uh, sorry, I went to Plainfield North. Well, I hate you. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh. But yeah, so you know, football, though, so. I understand. So we were new. So coming to AU, you know, the whole I had the whole mindset: college football player, college team, different level. We're gonna win. You know what I mean? And that's still the number one priority on my list. I want to win conference, and I want to do it for the team. And then I guess my next goal would be to be all conference. So before before a game, how do you specifically get ready for a game? Like, what's your pregame routine? My pregame routine, I usually, uh, you know, I try to get in in the locker room as early as possible to change into uh, at least like my girdle, my, you know, my uh, pants and undershirt. Then I usually head over to the weight room and I stretch and roll out for about 30 30 to 45 minutes, get myself nice and loose, Uh, have my headphones in to try to prepare myself mentally, you know, relax. I don't want to be too anxious for the game. I usually get taped up, things like that if I need to. You don't have any like specific superstitions or anything that you got to do or I like put on one shoe before the other or anything <laughs> like that. No, I usually pray. Um actually, now that you mention it, I usually so I put on my comps, put on my girdle, put on my pants in that order and then I put my undershirt on, roll my sleeves up, then I get my shoulder wrapped and I put everything on before my socks. My socks are always the last thing I put on. I would count that as a superstition. Yeah, you probably know that your OCD. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. It's just like, even in high school, I was the same exact way. It was like the last thing I always do before I get ready to head out to the field. I'll go to all my meetings without my socks on. Yeah. But before I, go, <laughs> get ready, before I get ready to go out to the actual field, I put them on and then tie my cleats up and head on out. Yeah, I was going to say, because I have like the same, same kind of routine. I uh, go one skate, other skate, back to the first skate to put on a pad. Nice. Go back to the other. So I, I get it. That's what I was wondering. Um, so what is the most rewarding thing about being a fullback in this offense? Well, for me, I love physicality. I love being able to hit. I love that contact. It's, you know, why I started playing fullback in the first place. Uh, so I feel like the most rewarding thing to me is the fact that, like, I'm basically, like, uh, a security valve. Like, I kind of just, if anything gets loose on the, like, if any defensive lineman gets loose, I kind of just have to clean it up so I get to hit him as hard as I can. You know what I mean? Um... You know, my job really is to lead block for the running back. You know what I mean? So, you know, we have really good running backs on the team, Jake Apple, Brandon Evans. You know, I love the guys to death. And, you know, my job is to make sure they get in the end zone, or at least, you know, 
the first down or whatever it is we're trying to accomplish. So I feel like the most rewarding thing for me is every time we get a first down and it comes off my block, I get a little like excited, excited. <laughs> <laughs> a little fire lights up and I just gain motivation throughout the game, you know? Do you ever get those short yardage, the like the the short yardage touchdowns? Have you gotten any of those yet? Or no? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we haven't had any fullback runs this year. Um, you know, I went on routes a couple times, uh, caught a few balls for for decent yardage, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> in your mind, in your mind. That's yeah, a, that, that's important. They're usually yeah. short routes, but uh, you know, it's still rewarding to be able to like go out from instead of just blocking all the time to get to go out and actually get the ball you know it's pretty cool so hopefully coach box you're listening to this coach mm-hmm. Sudeman, you know, <laughs> puts put a couple more fullback runs in there you know make a fullback nice and happy so <laughs> you mentioned coach Pox and you mentioned the new staff and the young team i'll put you on the spot a little bit do you think coach Pox and his staff have the team moving in the right direction yes we do coach Pox is honest he's a great man um now what i love about coach Pox is not only is he trying to make us a great football team by sticking together and having a nice family uh, you know, atmosphere, he wants to make us better people in general. He wants to make us great men in life. Um, so everything he does is specifically aimed towards making us better people. You know, It's not always about football because we understand that you know, after the, our four years of playing college football are done, most of us are not going to get another chance to play again. And after college, you know, the real world starts. We have a job, we have family, we have everything like that. So he's gearing us towards being great on the field and off of it. You know, he has us moving in a really positive direction. Um, you know, we're already seeing changes this off season from this past season. You know, things are already a lot more intense. Um, you know, the guys are sticking together. Coach Pox has made has made it so that we we're like one big unit you know what i mean not not a bunch of individual clicks within the team so i really feel like that's what you need in order to be great as a team so you've bought in all right <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I'm, I'm 100 percent bought in so okay, that's, that. um so what do you what do you think moving forward to next season is the most important improvement the team has to make the most important improvement let's see um there's a few of them, but I think the biggest one really is just to continue to buy in. Like, I know I, I might sound a little repetitive, but even during camp this year, you know, a lot of the guys said we were bought in, and you know, we all stuck together. But you know, little by little, you see guys, you know, start to drop off from the team, quit, mm-hmm. you know, get kicked off because they're not 100 percent dedicated. You know, they'll think it's okay to miss practice a few times, just show up late, uh, show up late to morning liftings, things like that, not go to team meetings. Those are all the wrong things. You could be the best player in the world but and have the most skill, but if you don't buy in, if you don't do the right things when they need to be done, you know, you're no good to us. So I feel like that's really the number one thing. Make sure we have all the people there that we need when they need to be, you know, so uh what do you see as a future for your football career? Do you see one or <laughs> I would like to think so. I, mean, I have a 13 year old little brother. And he keeps asking me when I'm gonna, you know, enter the draft. So <laughs> I know it's probably not a possibility. Um, honestly, I, like I just finished my sophomore year. I have two more guaranteed years of football in my life. I faced some pretty serious injuries in the past, so I'm just trying to make sure, like, I stay healthy in the off season, things like that, avoid injuries best I can. Um, just trying to finish these two years off strong. I'd love to get a chance to play football after college, whether it's, you know, arena. See, I don't I don't care what it is, to be honest. I don't even if it's a flag football league, you know, football's the number one thing in my life. You know, I love it more than anything, so I'd love to be able to have a chance to continue playing, but I'll see where life takes me. You've me- okay, you mentioned not having a winning record your entire football career. <laughs> Despite those struggles, do you have a favorite moment from this season or your career in general? That sticks. Uh, um I'll mention two of them, okay? One of them is from my junior year of high school, you know, Plainfield East High School. We were hosting a home game week three versus rival Plainfield North. <laughs> now, we had never beat them before. As I said, we were a brand new team. I you graduated know, by know? this point, so. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> it's because I was gone. That's why. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Good luck. So, at them now. so yeah. you know, our, any game between Plainfield East and Plainfield North was always hyped up, you know, no matter what it was. But nothing was bigger than football. So I remember we were reading the newspaper one day, and a reporter asked the Plainfield North coach, you know, not to put him on the spotlight or anything, but <laughs> a reporter asked the Plainfield North coach, you know, how do you feel about the rivalry with Plainfield East? 
And he basically said, Plainfield East, that's not a rivalry. It's not a rivalry until they beat us. <laughs> and as I said, we have never beaten them at well, that point. Well, technically, that, that's so, true. No, so. it's true. But because true. we consider it a rivalry because they were like two miles down the road from us. You know what I mean? Yeah. So basically, that just fired us up. You know, our defensive coordinator got on the entire team, not just defense. And he was talking about, you know, playing more physical than we've ever played before in our life, having all that pride. He basically said, play like sharks in the water. Smell the blood. You know what I mean? As soon as you strike blood, smell it and attack. So we come out. We were hyped up. They were hyped up. It was probably one of the greatest games I've ever played in, and we demolished them, <laughs> thirty-eight to twelve. I won't forget it. <laughs> it. It was it was a great feeling. Um, you know, two of my receivers, Miles Walters and Jawan Strader. I know they're still playing sports out there. They uh they did a nice little hook and ladder play for about a seventy-yard touchdown. So that was pretty nice. sweet. Yeah. So that's probably my all-time favorite moment, just because we finally finally beat our rivals, created that rivalry, and then you know won the game. <laughs> And then I think my the second best for me would be my first start, which was at Rockford College, uh, week three of this season or week four of this season, excuse me. Um, just because, you know, in my head, I I just want I basically wanted to do whatever I could to help the team win, whether it was being on practice squad, all special teams, you know, scout team, <laughs> didn't matter to me. But being able to be in that starting situation was just like the greatest feeling ever you know because <laughs> oh just being a sophomore you know 19 years old contributing right yeah second year playing fullback ever you know i started my freshman year of college so it was like it was really exciting to me and i mean i won't say i had the best game but i think i had a pretty solid game and of course we won so 20 to 7 so that was pretty sweet and we were away so i i'd say that was probably my second favorite one <laughs> <laughs> all right so what are real quick what are your plans after you I know you still have a while here but after you graduate what are um, your plans well I am if you have any <laughs> I am a criminal justice major and I uh recently just uh declared a double minor in computer science and homeland security so I'd love to you know be a cop police officer for the first few years start off give my feet in the water I love you know that <laughs> whole aspect um my dream as a child and still now was always like FBI or you know, DEA, being an ATF agent, something like that. I always thought those things were really cool, being SWAT, like part of the SWAT team, anything like that. So basically just anything in the whole criminal justice field, you know, that's what I'm like gearing towards. So hopefully, you know, if things continue to go the right way for me, that's what I'll lean towards. Nice. All right. Well, so we're going to take a break. Uh, you're listening to Ziggs, Rolly, and Bonham on AU Spartan Radio. We'll be right back. Okay, class, take out your books. Man, I don't have any of my textbooks yet. Just go to the bookstore. They have what you need. Hey, are you going to the game tomorrow night? I don't think so. I don't have any AU clothing. The bookstore has a ton of apparel. They have what you need. Man, what am I going to do with all of these old books? Just take them to the bookstore. They buy back your old books. That's a great idea. Open Monday through Friday, the AU bookstore in Dunham Hall is stocked with textbooks and apparel. The bookstore is a great place that will have all the AU essentials that you need. How is your paper going? I'm having such a hard time with the APA format. Me too. I was having trouble with APA also, but not anymore. What? I made an appointment and took my paper to the Center for Teaching and Learning. The what? The Center for Teaching and Learning. It doesn't cost anything. You make an appointment with a professional one-on-one -on -one tutor for math, writing, and peer tutoring for other subjects. The Center for Teaching and Learning is located in the library. The hours are Monday through Thursday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., Fridays, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., and Saturdays, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. I can't believe the semester's almost over. I'm already thinking ahead to next semester. I know. Since I am working more, paying for school will be a lot easier. Work cut back on my hours, so I don't know how I'll be paying for it. Have you checked out the latest scholarships on the financial aid website? I applied for three in under five minutes. No, how do I do that? Go to the Aurora website and click on financial aid. Then go to applying for aid on the left-hand side. It's that easy? It's that easy. The office sends out emails, so check it often. Don't forget to fill out your FAFSA, too. Great. I'm going to get started on that. All right, welcome back to Ziggs Rolling Bonum on AU Spartan Radio. Uh, we're joined by Shaq Perez today. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the mess that is the Chicago Bears right now. Rob, you want to share uh, your feelings? Anybody have a vote of confidence for Mel Tucker or Mark Dressman? No. No? No. <laughs> no. I, thought, I thought so. And after the unsurprising mess they were against the Cowboys last night, you have to think 
maybe the changes are coming. I mean, the McCaskey family has never set that trend before. But you listen to guys like Matt Forte, who I want to specifically quote. After Thanksgiving, he he's visibly gotten more frustrated. He's becoming that one best player who just plays on bad teams and still produces. Mm-hmm. After Thanksgiving, he was quoted as saying, talent only gets you so far. He was very terse. He was very concise. I think it's really getting to him. Last night, when uh, he want, when people wanted to ask him what he wanted to say to the fans or to his teammates... He Next question. No. I, I think. I, I think. I don't even think he responded no. in kind at all. So, when Matt Forte is even getting frustrated now, you have to think the changes need to be made. I don't. I don't know if they will. At this point, nothing surprising. Nothing surprising with the Bears. They have their trends, and you know, as an awful organization in general. <laughs> if I was a betting man, I would put money on Mel Tucker being gone. And him, oh, be, no, him being the only one. That's a given. I think the only reason, I think the only uh, way Mark Trustman loses his job is if the Bears give up 50 points again and get blown out, which I thought was going to happen last night, but no, the Cowboys had, and had to play prevent and let the Bears get back into the game <laughs> and give them hope. And now Phil Emery's going to cite it in his postseason press conference. Oh, I, I really appreciate the resiliency. Oh, I think Mark has the team headed in the right direction. This, the Chicago Bears football teams will be a... Phil Emery is a man of broken promises, a man of empty promises, and that's exactly what he's going to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I agree completely. I feel, honestly, I feel like probably one of the only coaches that should stay on the staff is Aaron Cromer. Um, other than that, I think they should all go. I mean, you have players like like Robert said, uh, like Matt Forte, Kyle Long, if anybody saw his tweet this morning or I think it was late last night, basically like apologizing for, for everything that's going on. You know, he's ta- he basically talked about how like, you know, he's going through it too to, dr- just, to just try to stick with it. But um, there's only so much you could do as a player. I feel, and you know, with a coaching staff that's not really leading the team well, you have no leadership from the head coach. It's kind of hard to win. So you have players like Matt Forte, Kyle Long, uh, Martellus Bennett, Brandon Marshall, Alshon Jeffrey. You know, all superstar caliber players. You know, really good, all Pro Bowl players for the most part. And you have a losing record, and you're getting blown out in a lot of games. And if you look at the team. In a defensive standpoint, they're not. <laughs> see, defensively, I give them more of an excuse because they're not talented. I think more defensively, it's that they're not put in the right position. They have a lot of young players that are on the rise, and Tucker just doesn't like let them succeed. They they never seem to be organized or or how they they, they don't do their jobs. Even even a less talented defense, even a, a defense that has their, that has this awful secondary the Bears have, should be able to be somewhat respectable. But, you know, when the Bears go down, when the Bears are getting blown out or anything like that, it always seems to come in bunches. It always seems to come in three or four touchdown bunches. And then it, it just looks like they've, they they quit. It literally looks like they quit. I, I don't see how that's a bigger indictment. All right, so you say the, the coaches are just, like, selling promises. He's not going to keep up, right? That's what you're saying, though? Yeah. Okay, well, wouldn't you think that any coach would do that just to save his job? Like, I could think of probably every coach would honestly lie to the media just so he keeps oh, his not, job. But. I'm not saying that it's not the right thing to do for them, but <laughs> it's obviously going to frustrate the media and frustrate the fans because at this point he's just speaking. To, he's, not, he's not preaching to the choir, I'm so, telling you that much. So do you think the fans would be happier if he told the truth? Like, oh, yeah, well, we don't have the talent or, you know, the work I mean, if it was more honest there, about that, yeah. You know? He's... With Mark Tressman, I think it's more that he's in denial. He'll say, oh, I think we had really good practice. We had really good preparation. I don't think any of these guys have quit. It's the process. And he, and he yeah, said it. That's his trigger He said word. that four or five times in, in most of these blowout losses that the Bears have had. The, the last five losses, actually, the Bears have lost by at least 13 points in each of those games. And he said sort of the same sentiments each time. At some point, it's denial. More, more just... Own up to the mistakes. Maybe you'd earn a little brownie points back with the fans who want <laughs> your job gone, want your job more and more every day. I um I want to relate that back to the whole leadership standpoint. You know, being in the ROTC program, um, you know, it's focused mainly on leadership, and you you learn how to be a great leader and things like that. And just seeing Mark Trustman really gets me angry, like during the games, because 
he's kind of just hanging out on the sideline, just watching the game. Really, you don't really see him do much, and 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 that's fine. But then when you look at the press conferences or like any interviews with the coach, he kind of just he says the same thing all the time, but he doesn't really act on it, you know. And as a leader, you have to be able to own up to your mistakes, and you have to be able to figure out a solution, you know, and try to try to become better. And a few weeks ago, we heard all that speculation of the Bears, of I mean, of uh, you know, Mark Tressman losing the locker room and things like that. You know, like that the, they don't really trust him anymore. And I think that all has to do with his leadership. If a player does not trust the coach, there is no team. You're not going to be able to win. You're not going to be able to do anything. You have to be able to trust your coach. And the number one way that a coach gains a player's trust is by leading them in the right direction. And when he makes a promise being able to fulfill that promise. And as Robert said, I mean, there's a lot of players in the wrong spots, things like that, a lot of inexperience. He, as a coach, has to be held accountable for that. He has to be held accountable for his own actions. And, I mean, he basically just needs to show some leadership. It's great, funny. Him, great, sorry, Connor. It's sorry. funny because he wrote a book about leadership. Oh, well, that was, <laughs> that was in CFL. And the great thing about him and the Bears is that you have someone like Shaq talking from first-hand experience about how horrible of a head coach he is, and then the McCaskies are going to give him an excuse unless they get yep. absolutely embarrassed again. It's all about but, money. <laughs> well, They don't want to just throw away two anyway. years I left think, on the deal. I think Virginia McCaskey wants to win a title. She just doesn't really understand football. I think she's well, her, son, of your, her son doesn't who? understand football. Was, George is running the team, right? Michael, Mike, was, Michael Michael was the one that didn't understand it, but he's not running it anymore. George McCaskey's the one that wanted to fire Lovey Smith after ten win season. So maybe things will yeah. change. Maybe Mark Trestman's going to lose his job, and we'll, we'll sweep sweeping changes. We'll see Jim Harbaugh. But <laughs> that's, that's, that's just a dream. That's his hope. You can only hope. <laughs> Shaq had a nice segue. If the players don't trust in the coach, I, I'll give Mark Trestman that. I think in his tenure, which hopefully is over after two years. <laughs> Some guys have just not completely bought in. You, you talk about guys like Tim Jennings, who every now and then has some comments in the media. Lance you, Briggs. Well, I was going to get to that. Yeah. You have Charles Tillman, <laughs> who on Comcast or in general, talking about how much he misses Lovey, how much it, it, it just speaks to these guys missing their glory days, which weren't even that great. They only made the playoffs three times out of nine years and they're, they're lamenting these glory days and missing Lovey and how great it used to be with their defensive coach. That doesn't help when three of your primary leaders in the locker room aren't fully behind, aren't fully behind Tressman. I, I'll give him that. But he you, has a little pass there, I guess. But do you blame the players there or do you blame Mark Tressman for not being able to, to sell himself for them to buy in? See, they're such veterans, and they played through the, through the majority of their careers with Lovey that I felt I feel that they probably wouldn't have followed Tressman unless they won. Unless say the Bears won eleven games last year or mm-hmm. were division contenders. That the only the only way he could have won them over was winning, which obviously hasn't worked out. So all the problems have folded in up on themselves. And you talk about a guy like Lance Briggs, who the Bears willingly let go of Brian Urlacher. So he could be the leader of the defense, lead the linebackers, get everybody set. They thought he could be that kind of franchise player. They thought, you know, he wasn't living in Erlacher's shadow. And I still think he's one of the best Bears linebackers ever, but these last two years have soured me a little bit. He's had uh, injury problems, and some pe- some people would say that's bad luck. But then you look at him not coming into camp both in, in, sh- in shape both years, which... He hasn't well, they, done. He hasn't done that his whole career, though. Even more so these last two years, yeah. where, he, where they've given them the the contract extension, and you see him on the field. He's not making. He's not playing at the same level. Some of it. Some of it's due to age, and some of it's due to to the decline. But Lance Briggs sort of played a lot more into his selfishness, and it's another. It's just another part of the whole collapse of this organization as a whole. Yeah. I, I, I well, think, yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, I was wondering, is that a coaching fault or is that a player fault? Because, well, I mean, you're blaming the coaches for things, but, I mean, players also have to take responsibility for their own actions. Like, if they don't buy into a coach's system, is that really the coach's fault necessarily or is that the players too? Well, it's 
I'd say it's more Lance's fault because again he hasn't bought in what Trespin's doing. He misses. It's clear that Lovey was his guy, and no matter who the Bears hired, I think it was a mistake to keep all the Lovey veterans anywhere. Well, they yeah, were past their primes, and 2012 was really the last. The, it should have been the last year for most of them, as you see guys like Tillman who hasn't played a full season. He's he's played eight. Uh, he's played uh, ten games yeah, out of twenty four in two seasons. I would just assume that you get past that. Like you're a grown adult. If you're oh well, I only like this coach. I'm not going to play for that. Co-. Like you're you're selfish at that point. Like the, not- the players are accountable, but it's still the coach. It's still going to reflect on the coach if they're not buying in. Oh well, yeah. You're going to be mad at both sides. I feel um, really strongly that it's also the it's mainly a veteran fault because of the fact that as a veteran you have to show like leadership in the locker room if young players especially rookies you know new to the NFL new to the league they see that you don't really buy into what the coach is saying they're going to start to question the coach themselves and they're going to start to question things and they're, then they're going to think oh well it's okay if I don't buy in I'm just going to go out there play how I want to play get my paycheck and you know Hopefully we win the game, and if we don't, well, I'll see you guys in a couple seasons when I go to a different team, you know, things like that. So as a veteran on a team, you need to be able to really point those younger guys in the right direction. You know, you have to try to buy in. Okay, you're not in the office. You can't make coaching decisions. You're not going to be like, oh, yeah, I want this coach. Let's hire him. No, your job is to play for that coach. So we all get it. None of us really want Mark Tressman back. But if you were playing on that team... You have to try to buy in as best you can to what he does, at least until the season's over. Because if you don't, you're going to end up with a horrible record, just like the Bears. So And see, no one set the example. You brought that up. It's like you almost perfectly described Lance Briggs. Now he's done for the season. He's on, he's on IR with yet another injury. And you see the embarrassing, all-time, historically awful Bears defense we have now. I think there's... I think Trestman should lose his job again. We've said it so many times. I'm hoping for Jim Harbaugh. <laughs> but at this point, you know, you hope we lose out. You hope we blow everything up. And maybe ne- maybe next year or the year after we can be a true contender. I'm willing to wait as a patient Bears fan. I wanted to get to one. Besides that, I wanted to get to one final thing. Green Bay is obviously the clear media favorite. The clear favorite. I mean, they beat New England at home. Home field has to be factored in there. But I think the Seahawks are back on the rise. I think they figured it out again. I think I don't think they ever lost it. I think they just you know they were playing good teams. They lost to the Chiefs. They lost to Dallas. I think if Seattle can somehow snag home field again, maybe the dynasty in the Pacific Northwest continues or starts up again. I still think Arizona wins the division. See, I think Arizona's going to completely collapse. Really? I, their Collapse. offense has been non-existent with Drew Stanton, and they have a really tough schedule down the, start, down the stretch. I don't think they make the playoffs. Well, it's hard to continue to have don't a great make the offense. At all. Wow, Wait, okay. Whoa, okay. <laughs> well, well, it's hard to you know have a great offense or continue having a great offense when your starting quarterback goes down. You know, to horrible injuries exactly. like that. But they're not playing horrible. They just need to be able to start to click together, and it's hard to do in such a short amount of time. It's not like he's been. It's not like uh, you know, the starter quarterback went down week two or three. No, he went down so late in the season after they were, you know, had the best record in the NFL, basically tied with New England. So, I feel like if you give them like at least another week or so, they're going to start clicking and become the dominant offense they were in the beginning of the season. They weren't really a dominant offense, even with Palmer, and now well, they're playing St. Louis, who's really who's played against some really good teams and blown them out. And they're going up against. <laughs> they have Dallas, and they have Detroit on their heels, who, who both have nine wins. I if, don't know if Arizona loses this week, Seattle take retakes the control of the division, and the tower spiral continues. I have Dallas. Bruce Arians. Bruce Arians is a great coach, but he can't he can't make, make up for all his injuries. Uh, I, now that you mentioned the, the game versus Dallas, uh, I think Arizona's going to win that game. Dallas is going to pull classic Dallas and in December, <laughs> in December, no, 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 no. And start, and start start their decline. I mean, you Arizona can kinda, is not playing Dallas. I'm saying Dallas is oh. at nine wins, and they're on Arizona's heels. Arizona still has to play Seattle again. They still have to play San Francisco. They're playing St. Louis, and they're playing St. Louis twice. So, not exactly a favorable schedule in any sense. 
We'll see. They <laughs> might they might lose out. I'm, I wouldn't be shocked. They might lose out. I guess it wouldn't be shocking, but I still have confidence. So I mean, <laughs> I'd be happier if Seattle makes it and wins the division and gets home field because. It's but they have a better chance of keeping Green Bay out of the Super Bowl. So. Oh, of course. I mean, yeah. As I, long as they get home field, they will. But I, I, I think, think that, that, I think they could go on the road in Lambeau either. But I just think overall they're the better team. I think that matchup is dependent on home field advantage. Whoever plays at home would win that game, in my opinion. I mean, the ultimate goal right now as a Bears fan is just to watch Green Bay lose. So, yeah, so <laughs> especially in the playoffs, you know, Seattle is clearly the better team. You, you hope for the best. You hope for the best. <laughs> hope for the best. Hopefully. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the first half of Ziggs Rolling Bodum on AU Spartan Radio. We'll be right back. <sighs> I'm so tired. I was so active this summer, but hate running in the cold. Well, why don't you go to the gym? The gym? I can't afford a gym membership, and I'm saving up for spring break. Just go to AU's Fitness Center in Jenks Hall. I was there last night on their new elliptical machine. Plus, it's open till midnight, Sunday through Thursday, and free for students. That's a great idea. Plus, no one wants to see a fat guy in a Speedo on spring break. I'm having trouble studying. How do you get such good grades? I study at Phillips Library. Why don't you go? How's that going to help? There are individual study rooms. What about the book selection? Phillips Library has a collection of more than 99,000 books and 7,000 multimedia materials. That sounds great, but I work till 10. And? Phillips Library is open until 2 a.m. Monday through Thursday. Well, I don't know how to find my way around the library. That's why there's a friendly staff ready to answer any questions you have. Hey, where are you going? To the library. Are you looking to get involved on campus? Are you a communication major or minor? Then you should join Lambda Pi Eta. Lambda Pi Eta is the official honor society of the National Communication Association and is here at Aurora University. Lambda Pi Eta offers many opportunities to volunteer and network with other communication professionals, not to mention it will look great on your resume. If you are interested in becoming a member, contact our president, Tiffany Walls, at twalz01 at aurora.edu. Be a smarty and join LPE. Welcome back to Ziggs Rolling Bodum on AU Spartan Radio. Uh, we're going to start the second half of the show by talking about the Bulls and how they're final. How Derrick Rose specifically is starting to string to game string games together. Um, you heard the the comments by Thibodeau after the Denver game. It was Denver. Yeah, yeah it was the Denver game where Derrick Rose didn't play the second half, where he said, "You know, Derrick's just got to play. He's just, he just has to keep playing." And I think I think Derrick Rose finally got that message. Because he's played, he played in back-to-back games. He played heavy minutes the night before too. Well, not heavy compared to some other players, but heavier minutes than he's played this this season. So I, I think Derek is finally starting to get the the message, and I think the Bulls are responding that to to that really well. Because they're, I mean, they're a dominant team well, when I think they're playing. It, I think right? it's big when any star player team comes back, like even if it's just for a little bit, like. It is great to just, you know, not give him the entire game. Like, you know, play the second half. But just the fact that he's playing, it not just gives the fans confidence, but I think it gives the team confidence. Like, oh, look, we got our main guy back. Like, that's what you want. You want to get him slowly back into it. So, I think that's great. My biggest thing with the whole Derrick Rose situation, i um, kind of upset at most of the fans uh, because of the fact that they're treating it, you know, they're taking it so poorly. I mean, I get it. It's frustrating to see... The superstar player, you know, former MVP, constantly missing games because he's hurt. I mean, I'm so happy about the fact that he's, you know, stringing a couple games along. But in the long run, the Bulls are going to make the playoffs without Derrick Rose regardless. The main thing is making sure he's healthy for the playoffs. The Bulls can't, like, compete for a championship without that superstar caliber. Um, So it's... it's they have Jimmy now, so... I they, have, they have two superstars. I mean, I understand. Yeah. Pau Gasol is playing like a superstar this yeah. year too. Yeah, I understand all that, but it, the the missing component is has always been Derrick Rose. If you look at the past playoffs, they've done great. They've competed. They were just not able to get to that next level, and Derrick is going to be the guy to do that. So, as a fan, you have to just try to understand that when a player wants to sit out to rip, to avoid injury, you know, you kind of just have to let him do things like that. At the same time, Derrick needs to. You know, keep doing what he's doing. Um, take it easy, but try to you know push himself a little bit in the games. Because if he's going to be too scared to get injured, then what's going to happen in the playoffs? He's going to end up, you know, doing the same exact thing. So um, it's good to see him coming back. You know, bouncing back the way he has been. He's been playing pretty good. Um, 
like to see him start performing a little bit better, uh, driving in a little bit more. I understand he's still probably scared to to power it in the paint like he used to, but you know, at this point in the game, you kind of got to start going back to your old roots. Shaq again with the great segue. I was actually going to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> the last four games, it's I think it's a real concern because in the last four games of the seventy six shots he's taken, thirty nine have been of them have been three. And do we know Derrick Rose as this specifically lights out three point shooter like Steph Curry or anything? Not at all. He's no, not picking and prodding or being really aggressive. Here's here's my opinion on that, and I I actually like this version of Derrick Rose better than... Not better. Turnover, Obviously, no, no, not, turnover problem? Okay. <laughs> That's still the rust. The turnovers are going to be cut down. And Jack He's still he rusty. I'm okay with that. Here's why. Okay, in his MVP season, and what was it, 2010-2011, yes. he, he destroyed his body that entire season because he went to the lane and he got hit. And he got hit hard and he got hit hard every single game. Derrick Rose right now is playing like Tony Parker. And he's a better three-point shooter than Tony Parker. Tony Parker gets into the lane, creates shots for his teammates, and he's surrounded by shooters. This Bulls roster right now has shooters. You got Dunleavy, Jimmy Butler's improved improved his three-point shot. You have once McDermott figures out what he's doing, <laughs> maybe he can finally start making some shots. Miritich can make shots. Pau Gasol can make outside shots. Even Joakim Noah is starting to shoot better from the outside, which is weird. Well, the long, the long, the long two. Tornado the long twos. Two. If you look but, at that Boston game. <laughs> but this version of Derrick Rose where you're getting his teammates involved and he's he's racking up the, uh, the assists, you see some of the passes that he's making? He's seeing the floor better now than he ever has. And I think this will extend his career. Much longer, and it's this version of Derrick Rose that's going to be able to be healthy in the playoffs. He's a better passer, I'll give you that in, in comparison to Parker, but he doesn't have the same offensive game. If he can't drive into the lane, or if he doesn't have his mid-range game going, like any point guard, which obviously he, he doesn't have right now, he, he can't get anything going. He's not a lights out three point shooter. He's got to, I mean, he's literally, he has to, a lot of these shots are heat check shots or contested. Th- just bail out offense because he, he still feels he has to do too much. I prefer he do too much if he had something a little more reliable to fall back on a better shot. And this isn't this isn't a small sample size anymore. I think the last specifically the last like three or four games he's in the fourth quarter. You see him go to the lane when he has to, like when the other team is making a run, he'll go to the lane. He'll get an easy layup or something like that. But otherwise, he's getting everyone else involved. I think that's his priority right now is to get everyone else on the team involved. This is why you see Jimmy Butler is still the leading scorer, even though Derrick Rose has played a bunch of consecutive games now. Pau Gasol is still averaging 20, 22, minutes, 22 points a game. All Everyone else's points are inflated from years past because Derrick is trying to get them more involved. And I think that is really actually very important and I think that's kind of a key the Spurs have had so much success I mean this Bulls team is clearly modeled after the Spurs it, it they're is what, trying to they're trying that. to be after, modeled after the Spurs which makes a lot of sense but I think you see the success that a team like the Spurs have had against the Heat in, in the last few years and they should have won the first final series they against should. them but that's yeah. besides the point <laughs> the Spurs have had so much success against teams with three superstars the Bulls noticed that, and I think that's why I, I think the Eastern Conference Final. I'm just going to say the Eastern Conference Finals between the the Bulls and the Cavs yeah. is going to be a great series because well, Kyrie Irving's not a superstar, so we've already talked about that. But th- I think that's why See, that's I, why this system that the Bulls are running makes so much sense. All right, so are you <laughs> are you trying to say that like Rose is <laughs> trying not to be a superstar so much anymore? He's trying to give it to no, Butler and other people. He's players? still a superstar. But he has to get everyone else involved. Right. But that, Shaq, go ahead. Just say, just say what you have to <laughs> say. You look so frustrated right now. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I disagree with you. To me, Kyrie Irving Wait, is... Like, who do you disagree with? Just make sure. With Robert. Okay. Okay, okay make it quick, though, because okay. you seem pretty angry about it. Okay, uh, to be honest, <laughs> I feel that Kyrie Irving is a rising superstar. He has the superstar caliber. He has the ability to put the team on his back and do whatever it takes to win. He has the skill. He has the offensive talent. Okay, he honestly, in my opinion, he's a superstar. He's a top five point guard in the league. Oh, okay, and 
Get ready for his rebuttal. Just no, get ready I, for I, it. I'm, please, I'll, I'll take the rebuttal. <laughs> but in my opinion, if you look at the games and you look at what he's been able to do before LeBron and Kevin Love were both on the team, by himself in a team full of nobodies, realistically, Kyrie Irving has been able to produce and be a really good player. LeBron took a team and nobody's to the finals. Yeah, uh, Kyrie Irving, volume <laughs> scorer that gets his own and has heat check shots through his first three or four years in Cleveland. And what's their average victory total? 25? <laughs> uh, top five point guard Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook, Tony Parker, Derrick Rose, Dave, Damian Lillard. And there's a lot more. I don't. I'm not sure where you put Kyrie in there. Okay, Shaq, let's run through. Okay, who? <laughs> all right, I'm gonna Kyrie, and then I'm gonna name point guards, and you tell me who you would rather have: Derrick Rose, a healthy Derrick, a healthy Rose, Derrick Rose. Rose. Okay, a healthy Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose, right now, I'm not too. A healthy, sure. so a really, healthy Derrick back Rose. In. Okay, so it's we'll put that one aside because Tony Parker, hard. Derrick Rose. I'm asking Shaq, not <laughs> Rob. Me, not you, Robert. <laughs> Tony Parker. Uh, I'd rather have Kyrie. Okay. Uh, Chris Paul. <laughs> Chris Paul. Steph Curry. Steph Curry. Clearly, st- why do you not, even hesitate? Damian he's the Lillard. MVP right now. That's true. Damian oh. Lillard. Kyrie. A healthy Rajon Rondo. Oh, Rajon. Wow. You don't look happier than any of these results. Uh, like your hesitate. survey took a See, quick. Wow. Quick he hesitated time. on Steph Curry, and about, no, I wasn't hesitating on Steph Curry. I was just. How about Kyle Lowry? All right now he's hesitating. It's it's, it's I'll Lowry. Take, Kyrie. I'll, I'll take Kyle Lowry. Lowry. Really? Kyle Lowry's yeah. defense is a hundred percent better than Kyrie. Kyrie doesn't even play defense. Kyrie's a volume, a glorified volume <laughs> scorer. He's the third. He's not. So he's James sure Harden. He, I'm not even sure he's the third best player in his team. Tristan Thompson is the third best player in the Cavs. Wow. Wow. Okay. That's a bold uh, statement. That's a bold statement. Or no, right, I'll say that. I'll say this. Okay, forgive me. I'll say this. I'll say <laughs> that Kyrie is a top five scoring point guard in the league, just based off his ability to fair enough to score. Yeah. Um, but if you look at like overall, you know, abilities and all that, you can't disagree with the fact that he's at least top ten. I'll say I'd top put 10. him top ten. Yeah. But there's a lot of good point guards. No, I understand. That's the, bro- that's the problem with the NBA right now. Is that, well, it's not a problem, but the amount of good point guards that there are in the league right now is it has never been – there's never been more. I think it's because of Allen Iverson. Run, can you run that by me again? Tristan Thompson. <laughs> I meant, I meant Verjao. Thompson came in my head. Verjao is, is a more important player for the Cavs. I would argue Kyrie Irving is better than Kevin Love. I hate – I. I don't like Kevin Love. I I don't think he's good. What? Why don't? I'm sorry. I just need to hear you. Okay. <laughs> Kevin Love has been on been in this league for six years now. I think same same thing as Kyrie, right? Not no. Kyrie hasn't no, been no, in for six le- six years. Same type but, of player. Yeah, Kevin Love is a shooter. He's a power forward shooter who doesn't like to post up. I mean, he, when he's good at posting up, too, he should post up more, but he doesn't like to. He just likes to jack up threes. He's a a good rebounder, but he gets the he's like Carlos Boozer when it comes to rebounding. He doesn't get any like difficult rebounds like Joakim does. He just gets all the easy clean up rebounds. And then he he's not a good passer really, except for the outlet passes that he throws like two times a game. Which and he doesn't which play aren't really available in the postseason. Yeah, and he doesn't play any defense at all. Kevin, I, mean, I think Kevin Love is I. When the Bulls were, when it was rumored the Bulls were trying to trade for him, I was I was furious because Taj Gibson is playing better than Kevin Love is this year. Were you ready to jump ship? You're like, I'm no, I wasn't gonna. I'm not gonna jump ship. But Taj Gibson I, I has been playing it. better than most point guards in the league or uh, most power yeah. forwards in the league for the past two seasons. I also think Miritich is going to be better than Kevin Love. I also think Powell is much better and a better overall yep. number one option than the three. Love. The three of them individually are all better than Kevin Love. I think. The Bulls are in good shape. That's that, yeah. That, that I think <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. Is the Bulls are in very, very good shape. You mentioned all the good point guards in the league. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about Kirk. You know, on the other side, on the other <laughs> side of that, <laughs> on the other side of that, dumb foul. No, I don't foul. I think that's the Heinrich way. You know, turnovers at the end, turnover, <laughs> bad turnovers at the end of the game, dribbling or off the shot, half the shot clock. 
Okay. Jump fouls. Okay. <laughs> Let's <laughs> not put all. This I'm, not negativity. Putting it all on, I'm not putting it all on Kirk. I'm just saying know, his I trends. Know. Let's. Okay. But if you think of, of the positive as Captain Kirk. Yes, I called him Captain Kirk. Okay. <laughs> Some people <laughs> call him Kurt. It, not even Kirk. I said, you know, I said Kirk. Yeah, I know. I, I, that's good. That's good. I know. If you look at what he's been able to do, you know. <laughs> You know they drafted him what 2006 2007 no, 2003 they drafted him 2003 or no 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 I'm I'm sorry I'm thinking about the playoff series against Detroit Let's... in 2007 I believe I think it was 06 or 07 but yeah, yeah it was yeah. 06 okay if you look at what he was able to do in that series alone okay and then look at what he's been able to do every every year since he's been a really solid player I understand that you're frustrated at what he's been doing like his late game tendencies not even the late but, game tendencies he can't run the offense he <laughs> dribbles off half the shot clock every other possession and he doesn't move the ball and people will give him credit for making a few threes and then he'll brick a few and then he'll brick like five shots in a row he's not he, he can't even fill the backup point guard over he's pathetic right now he's way past any credibility <laughs> i i give him a little bit more credit than you do rob i think he's i personally think he is Important for the Bulls to moving forward because you can't rely. Aaron Brooks plays no defense. He can score, but Aaron Brooks plays no defense. He's just you need he a, just stands there. You need, uh, it's oh, it's brutal well, to watch well, him Kirk play plays defense. defense. But Kirk can't do anything in offense, so the Bulls have have no. <laughs> Bulls have, you know, why, can't, why, why can't we put them together? Why can't we He's put them together? Forty four percent this year from three. From three. <laughs> okay, how about when he dribbles in the middle of the lane? <laughs> <laughs> how many how many three point shots does he take a game? Two or three? Well, hopefully, Impressive. hopefully Derrick Rose takes some of his minutes away, and you rely <laughs> yeah, you on you know him that'd less. be that'd be great. I, I, I Wouldn't that be more, nice? Eight more and less. Of well, Derrick Rose doesn't play much defense, either, but that's, <laughs> <laughs> so that's I, besides I like, the point. The Der- one thing Derek plays could, decent enough defense, right? Stays in front of him at yeah. least. The one thing I could say about Kirk Heinrich is that he's consistent in this. Consistently inconsistent in this. <laughs> when <laughs> he's consistent in the fact that. If he's having a good game, you know, or obviously if everybody's having a good game, they're going to be consistent. But, like, he has a consistency factor to shoot lights out one game. You know, he'll keep making all his shots, take the game over. I remember I went to a Lakers game, I believe, two years ago when Derrick Rose was hurt, and Kirk Heinrich had an unbelievable game. He played like a superstar that game. But then he also has the consistency factor, as you said, where – He's just going to make a lot of dumb decisions. you know. And he's 34 years old. This isn't a rookie making those mistakes. It's a veteran in the league. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, that's well, why he doesn't start. So, All right, we'll, we're a little late for a break. we got to take a break real quick. Uh, so we're going to head to another break. Uh, you're listening to Ziggs Rolling Bottom on AU Spartan Radio. Man, I've been trying to play the piano forever, and I just can't get the hang of it. Does your music sound like this? <laughs> eh. Or do you want it to sound like this? Consider Aurora University's prestigious music program, offering an ever-expanding variety of musical instruments such as guitar, piano, flute, and voice. There is something here for everyone. Let the distinguished, musically talented faculty enhance your musical abilities to their utmost potential and also enrich your cultural experience. Aurora University's music program. Musicians of the future, develop today. I'm so glad I joined the music program. Man, I've been just about every game I own. I pinned just about everything on Pinterest. I wish there was something else we could do. Tired of letting the hours slip away in your room? Want to tap into your creative side? The Perry Theater is the place for you. Theater? Theater. I I can't can't act. act. The theater is so much more than just being on stage. You could be involved in tech work, set building, hair and makeup, and so much more. We should get involved, but how? Just contact the heads of the theater department, Kelly Roush or John Coran, for more information. There's three shows a year, so there's plenty of opportunity to get involved. The Aurora University Theater, a warm and welcoming environment where every person helps make a difference. <coughs> Uh-oh, sounds like the flu. I don't have the flu. Achoo! Yeah, right. Why not check out the Wellness Center? The what now? The Wellness Center, a free nurse-directed student health service open to everyone, even commuters. Yeah, but that means I'll need an appointment. No, no, no. Walk-ins are welcome, but appointments are appreciated. Okay, but where do I go? The Wellness Center, located in the basement of Jang's Hall, right next to the Fitness Center. Hours are 8.30 to 4, Monday through Friday. Go check them out. Who are you going to call? The The Wellness Wellness Center. Center. All right, welcome back to Zig's Rolling Bonum on AU Spartan Radio. Uh, We're going to finish the show not talking about Kyrie Irving, Rob. 
Uh, so <laughs> has nothing to do with hockey. Uh, yes. Okay. Nothing so, <laughs> Will, what do you want to talk about? I would love to talk about hockey. Something I actually know about. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna start off with the, you know the Blackhawks. Obviously, um, on fire right now. They are, and I'm very surprised about it. Surprised. surprised. I'm surprised. Why? Are... Because of the recent lineup of teams playing LA. They don't have a great track record of playing LA, and they beat them four to one. They beat St. Louis 4-1, to one, one of the hottest team. team in the league. And I honestly thought their recent circus trip, they were going to go like 3-2, and two, you know, some of that. And I think they went 4-1 and one, or 4-0-1, oh and one, I think. It was, I was impressed. I was not surprised by them beating uh, Edmonton, I think it was 7-1. to one. <laughs> That wasn't surprising at all. But the, I don't know. I was... Uh, I was a little surprised. I didn't think it was going to go that way. Especially with um, uh, Sharp being out, right? Yeah, but, I mean, ever since uh, Kane and Taves came back, it's it really is a different team than the beginning. Yeah. So, that I didn't really think that was going to impact them as much as when Kane and Taves was out. So, it didn't, at that part, I'm like, eh, Sharp's out, which he is a great player, don't get me wrong, but he's no Kane or Taves, so I wasn't that shocked. You can't discount the Hawks anymore. I don't think it's surprising to see them <laughs> go on this. They, they have a championship pedigree. This is a team with such a veteran roster that games like, even simple regular season games like against the Kings or the Blues, they're going to have that circle on their schedule to try to send a little, you know, a, a regular season statement. This is a team that's been through so much. Oh, well, they when they do. go on to, When they go to terms like this, it's... No, no, they definitely do have those games circled. But, I mean, the Blues and the... And the Hawks, they have a great rivalry going. Like, I think it literally, like, every other game, the other team wins pretty much at this point in the season. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the Kings, though, this year, they've definitely been struggling. I think the Kings beat them so far two out of three meetings. Like, this is their first win against them for the season. I don't know. It's just... uh, I think that was actually the first time they met. I'm not going to put myself on the spot, but... I thought... I'm pretty sure they played earlier, because I remember them playing one game and I wanted to go. Because they were building the... Kings and Blackhawks uh, as like the first rematch since their classic Western oh, Conference Finals this last. Oh. Maybe that was a different team. I want. All right, whatever. But what do you go, hockey guy? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a huge Hawks fan, so I'm following <laughs> that well. Uh, <laughs> no, but like just pulling up their schedule, they got the Canadians. I see that as a fairly easy win. The Predators, which I don't see as an easy win, considering they're the number one team in the league. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, they got Philip Forsberg, a rookie who is absolutely on fire. This kid has. I want to say points in his last 16 games. For a rookie? At least, yeah, for a rookie. Oh. He has at least one point in his last 16 games, which is unreal. And I was really pissed when Washington, my favorite team, <laughs> traded him for a player who had two years left in the league. That was it. He had two. And, like, he got rid of Flo- for Forsberg. Who? Martin Erat. <laughs> a no-name player. <laughs> you traded a, a Forsberg for Martin Erat. He had two. Uh, oh, <laughs> I hate being a Capitals fan. It sucks because they're awful. Join the dark side. You live it in Chicago. Sucks. Join the dark side. Nah, I, well, well, might as well root for a good team. You know, a championship, yeah, but, consistent championship contender. Well, I'm going to start rooting for now that Crawford's injured. Oh, you yeah. Mean, go ahead and talk about that. You mean Vezina Trophy let's, candidate Corey Crawford? I, let's talk about that. Already, I can't stand Crawford. You know that. I feel like it's more of a personal it thing is, now it's because, very he's, personal. because he's playing. It's, it's very, he's personal. Play, very personal. He's playing out of his mind. He's arguably the best. Again, Vezina Trophy candidate. You could argue he's probably one of the best goalies in hockey right now. And he's part of the reason that they were so dominant on I'm, that road trip. I'm always going to go back to the fact that his team that he has in front of him is unreal. Like it's Jonathan Quick has an unreal team in front of him. He does, and Jonathan Quick Henry is also a the Trophy. Exactly. You have exactly. to have a good defense in front of you. you but have I'm to just have a good saying, team like, in front of you. I can see... Just I'm not going back on that. Not, <laughs> <laughs> but he did injure himself going to a concert, which I also find hilarious. It was a... R- what? It was a, a rise, rise against. against. Yeah, yeah exactly. he wouldn't say that. <laughs> he wouldn't say the name of the concert, although other people tweeted it. Like, yeah. oh, I saw Crawford, so like, it's easy to find. Someone also tweeted, "I can't believe how drunk Crawford is right now." <laughs> I thought that was hilarious too. <laughs> In the long run, that works out for the Hawks because it gives them more rest. Well, I I personally like it because they brought Scott Darling back up, and I like Scott Darling because I I trained with him in the off season this year. Um, so a goalie just has to train with you to yeah. For that that's moment. how you because no. yeah. you because you talk about no. Barmalov. 
So let's get Crawford to meet Will Rolliter, and then maybe we'll stop the yeah. hate over maybe. a really good goalie. Uh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a little iffy. But I No, like, I like Scott Darling. He's he's a huge goalie, and he plays he plays phenomenally. I know his first start of the year, they won 2-1 to one against... Um, oh, shoot, who was it? I know. Oh, it was uh, San Jose. And he played an unreal game. And I think he got a shot the next game afterwards. So it's just... I like Scott Darling's play. I like the way he's aggressive, and he doesn't rely just on his angles. Like he can, he's athletic. Where I feel like Crawford lacks a little bit. Everything has to hit him in the chest, and I like to pick on Crawford's isn't, glove. Isn't Anthony Ranta going to be the like yeah, the starting he'll, goalie? He'll pretty much be the starting. But I was surprised that they actually played Darling as much as he did when Crawford yeah. got hurt before. But I love Ranta too. I think he's also a great goalie. You I know, just I like backup. You like anyone Crawford. better than Crawford? I, Except for Emery. I will not take Emery anyway. <laughs> I like the goalie with the highest safe percentage among goalies that have played at least 15 or 16 games. You know, Corey Crawford. So <laughs> It wasn't that for long. <laughs> but yeah. He's just going to keep that now because he's injured. Well, he's going to keep it for the next two or three weeks, and he's going to come back, and, uh, and he's, he's gonna probably going to be lights off. out again. Like, eh. Nah. And he's gonna drop off. <laughs> I think he's going to drop off. <laughs> Let's, let, let's, have, let's just get let's just get Corey Crawford on a Make a Wish Foundation for Will. And <laughs> <laughs> well, then you're gonna have Pecorine, who had the best stats in the league. I'm, I'm not saying he's better than Pecorine. No, but I'm just that. saying on a, a very questionably defensive team. Besides Shea Weber and then Seth Jones is he's all right for his sophomore year, but Pecorine did have the best save percentage in the league for quite a while. Same thing with. Uh, Anderson, and this is only Anderson's second season on Anaheim, and he had the best save percentage, I want to say, for the first four weeks of the season. So, it's eh, we can argue save percentage, <laughs> but I'm still going to go with Ronto. And like, wins. Really. And wins. Wins. It's, yeah. What? <laughs> wins? He has, oh, yeah, I think he has 11 or 12 wins, which is yeah, also he, top five in the league. What? Crawford. Yeah. Yeah, but he's not the. Why would you? He's not the best at that. Why are you bringing that up? <laughs> he's up there. He's not. He's yeah. up, or up there rather. Well, if you want to talk about wins, Miller has fifteen. He's second in the league on Vancouver. That's Van. They're not a good team. The real question is, Corey Crawford better than Kyrie Irving? <laughs> <laughs> We're not going over that. I was about to ask the same exact question. All right. So, do you think he has, uh, a, he has a championship? I'll take Kyrie. He has so, a championship. Are, are you are you saying? That Crawford comes back and he plays Derrick Rose minutes. Is that what you're saying? He's gonna just. He's, gonna know, he's not gonna finish the game. Oh, now you're going. Just, you're going with the whole hockey <laughs> is tougher than basketball <laughs> thing, aren't you? I'm just, you know, is that what he's gonna do? He's only gonna play this two guy. periods. He's not gonna. Corey finish. Crawford didn't tear both of his ACLs, and Corey Crawford didn't have all that uh, mental <laughs> struggle. So I think he's gonna come back and you know be lights out. I think. Derrick Rose doesn't deserve that. This will just into a should, we, should we? Should we? Right should we have Derrick Rose co- have a Make a Wish Foundation train? Besides, oh, the, I have nothing the, against Derrick Rose. Besides the injuries and everything, like now that you mentioned that that Derrick Rose had to overcome like that, that Crawford, I guess, has to as well. The one thing that Crawford <laughs> doesn't have to overcome is all the pressure that was put on Derrick Rose for the past two years. Ah. They no, because if you think about it, Derrick Rose had the the return, the first one. There's you think much about better, it, yeah. That was so much pressure because he knew that he had to come back and do whatever it took to get his body right to come back and win that ultimately he ended up overworking and his body still wasn't 100% even though you know there was rumors that he was 110% whatever you want to say. He came back, got re-injured. Then there was even more pressure with his second return because of the fact that there were so many promises that he was going to come back and then he got hurt. So he had to come he had to overcome all of that outside talk and all the pressure from the fans of the organization, his family, his friends, things like that, and his own, like, the, the pressure he was putting on himself to come back and be as great as he was. While Crawford, as you said, people aren't even mad at him. The other person that doesn't it. like Crawford is Will. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Literally. No, it. it's not just me, though. I know a lot of hockey players who don't like Crawford. Yeah, it's they're not, not from Chicago. Because they, oh, no, they, they, <laughs> they didn't train with him in the offseason. That's no, why they don't like Crawford. Not, <laughs> you guys suck. No, it's not even I, my teammates, I, I, the hockey teammates for the school, they don't like Crawford. Where are they from? Chicago. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> a lie. <laughs> Most of our team is from Chicago. <laughs> Most of your team's from Illinois. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> from this general area. Okay. How about that? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Here on Ziggs Rolling okay. Bonham where we open up old wounds. <laughs> 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 All right, Will, talk real You wanted to bring up goalie equipment. I did. Or I wanted to bring, bring up goalie equipment. Quick. And this actually ties into the injury. So 
him coming back, Crawford, it's not the same as I'm not going to bring up Derek Rose because we don't really know how down that again. <laughs> but the the way the pads are for goalies, it's definitely more suitable for like an ankle injury. You're not. Yeah, you're bending your ankle, but you're not going to roll it over because the way the skate is, the way the hockey gear is, your leg is set in that position. Mm-hmm. So it's only a two- to three-week turnover for him, but it's not like it's not like when he comes back, he really has to take it easy. Like, at that point, you're set. Like, once you're in the skate and everything, you're not moving out of it. Like, you're set. Not like where you're, you're wearing a sneaker and you can roll your ankle real easily. Mm-hmm. So that's not a problem. But, like, goalie equipment, they've cut down that you can't have risers in your shoulders, so you're... Your shoulder pads go up to your ears, which is ridiculous anyways. I'm fine with that. But, like, uh, shrinking the width of the pads from 12 inches to 11 inches, honestly, if anything, that just made goalies faster because it's less bulky. They can move easier. So I think stats have actually gotten a little bit better because of that. But they keep making the pads smaller. You have goalies now who are taking shots to the knees because their thigh isn't as well protected, so they have to come out in different gear, stuff like that. The glove is smaller, not a huge deal, but, like, when it comes to protecting when they're covering the puck, like their blocker now covers less area, so people are getting sticks to the hand, stuff like that. You've had a couple, couple uh, fractures and either fingers or wrist because of it. Wait, who got injured off of that? Um, I know Jimmy Howard has gotten injured off of it. Red Wings, right? Yeah, yeah, Red Wings. Um, uh, Pecorino was out for two weeks last year because he had fractured his finger in practice when a guy actually, you know, they were playing a scrimmage and got a little too rough, I guess. But it. I know there's other examples. I just can't think about the top of my head. But the people have gotten injured from stuff like that. Like, I know um, last year in the playoffs, Carey Price, he took a skate to the knee. And people were saying if the pads were like how they were two years ago, the skate would have just hit him in the pad. He could have finished the playoffs. And the Canadians could have arguably won that series where the Rangers won. So, like, our, I don't know if the pads are necessarily causing more injuries, but I wouldn't say they're helping to defend from them. I, I just... I don't know why they have to always change things like this. <laughs> I just don't get Maybe it. the NHL wants more goals, more parity. I guarantee but, that's what it is. Yeah, but the funny thing is, is they haven't. If anything, they've gotten less goals. It's like, harder to score in the NHL than it ever has been. Yeah, like, you make the pads smaller, but the thing is, is you make them smaller, goalies just get faster. They have less weight on them. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, you're still carrying around 20 to 30 pounds worth of gear, but you make it smaller, you have less in the way of you getting there. Why don't so, we just go back to the days when goalies didn't even have face masks? Well, I don't think I'd be allowed to play hockey then. <laughs> <laughs> right. old, school, tough, old school toughness. We Let's can't go. even fight in college. You want us to take you want goalies to be the only people that play smash? I say no pads up. at all. No pads? No pads at all. I tried Just no take chest protector one practice, and that that's didn't dumb. go very well. Yeah. That's not smart. <laughs> I, say, right. well, I say you don't wear a cup. I, yeah, oh take it like a man. Oh, I, I, used yeah. to play, I played third base I didn't want kids for anyway. seven years <laughs> and never wore a cup. <laughs> My first game playing catcher, I learned the hard way. Yeah. If you want, I mean, you can dress up as a goalie. I'll take a shot at your crotch. We can see how it goes. But. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> on that note, we're going to say goodbye for my partners, Robert Zaglinski and Will Rolliter. Uh, thank you for joining us in studio today, Shaq Perez. And our producers today are Devin Ortiz and Alex Lobb. I am Connor Bonham saying thank you for listening to Ziggs Rolling Bonham on AU Spartan Radio.